my great pleasure to welcome you to Stanford, for those of you coming from off campus. And from those of you coming on campus, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to and welcome you back to, as school gets started, the Stanford Silicon Valley New Japan Program's Public Forum Series. I'm Kenji Kushida. I'm a researcher here at the Japan Program in the Asia Pacific Research Center. I'm also the project leader of the Stanford Silicon Valley New Japan Project. We do these uh, public forum series about once a month. And <clears throat> usually we have wonderful guests who I'm so eager to hear from that I quickly run through what this program is about because I'm so excited to introduce them and hear what they're saying. However, today you have the misfortune of hearing from me. So I figured this is our fourth year that we've done this project. And the things that we're doing are actually on our website. But of course, nobody's going to go look at our website. Everybody says that, right? Say, yeah, go, go look at our website for details. No, no, you have better things to do. So I'm going to spend a few minutes to introduce what we've been doing, because uh, we've been busy, and hopefully it's all valuable to multiple parties. But of course, what we're going to talk about today is the main theme while you're here, harnessing Silicon Valley, how to make use of Silicon Valley, how to benefit from Silicon Valley while also giving benefit to Silicon Valley. The reason we're doing this project, Stanford Silicon Valley New Japan Project, is that it was very clear for quite some time that there was a lot that Japan had to offer Silicon Valley, and there was a lot that Silicon Valley had to offer Japan, but this just was not quite working the way that each party would benefit from. Silicon Valley didn't see what it could benefit from Japan, and Japan had trouble, Japanese firms had trouble, and Japanese individuals, for various reasons, were not set up to really become insiders in Silicon Valley to make use of the ecosystem. So <clears throat> I'll introduce uh, what we're doing. Uh, one of the things that we do is a big uh, summit that we've done. This is our third year. Uh, and I have some pictures of the summit. But from the summit, we've learned various things about the strategies that some of the very interesting big Japanese companies are doing here in Silicon Valley. But it's not well known outside the people who are not necessarily looking at them. So that's what I'd like to introduce today, the strategies, structures, and activities of innovative large Japanese firms in Silicon Valley. So a bit of an overview of the project, a brief overview of the big picture of Silicon Valley and Japan's relationships. Because without the overview, you don't have the context. And without the context, it can be misleading or difficult to understand or um, difficult to look where to look. And then challenges in harnessing the Silicon Valley ecosystem. There are challenges for everybody, but uh, it's very severe for Japanese companies for very good historical reasons. And some insights from our summit. So first, a little bit about the project. We have several project components. Public forum series with networking, like this one. Research and public output. Um, policy research and implementation. And outreach for symposia and other big activities. These are the pillars. So the public forum series, we have four different themes. We try to get people who are interesting to Japan, people who are interested in Japan, and a mix of people who are changing Japan, people who are changing or driving interesting things in Silicon Valley. And then the question, of course, is there are many public forum all over this campus. There's lots in Silicon Valley. But of course, if you're trying to sound like the smartest person in the room, you always ask the question, hmm, but how does it scale? Right? <laughs> so the question is, how do we scale the public forum series? Because we hear from very interesting people. I'm out of ideas. However, we have Justin back here who's videotaping this. Uh, and all of the videos of these public forum do go on our website. So it is something that you can go back towards. And if you look at the full list of the public forum, you can go and see what was said. So for example, Spotlight Japanese Startup. Many Japanese entrepreneurs, a new generation of them, keep coming to Silicon Valley to say hi, or they've been receiving investments from venture capitalists here. I hang out with a lot of Japanese entrepreneur community people in Japan. I'm from Japan. Uh, I grew up there. I came here for college. I go back. Going back to Japan is always a good thing for me. But I've been going about eight times a year. That's too much of a good thing. But uh, one of the things I do when I go back there is I hang out with a lot of these entrepreneur communities. And there are some, several focus points. And then a lot of them just come through. And if they come through and they say, hi, uh, I usually try to grab them and say, can you give a talk for us? So uh, companies like Wantedly or um, grid technologies, and some others. So we have a lineup of people coming up. And we're opportunistic about that. 
Another is harnessing Silicon Valley. For example, Atsuko Jenks from GSV Labs, uh, which is an accelerator, and they do various events for uh, startup community. They also host a lot of big companies, including Japanese companies, but also European companies, South American companies, and match them with startups and do a lot of training. So uh, she gave us a talk and others. Innovation in Silicon Valley, some of the interesting startups here that are interested in or already participating in proof of, proof of concept or other things with um, Japanese big companies. So for example, Citrine Technologies, we'll hear about them later, uh, who, who is doing proof of concept with uh, Panasonic and several others uh, was here. And then towards a new Japan, some of the interesting things that are happening in Japan. One of the people that we had, for example, uh, Alison Baum is the only uh, American Caucasian woman venture capitalist that I know of who lives in Japan. And it's very interesting because she does investments all over the world, but her LPs are big Japanese companies with a social mission. So various uh, interesting people that we tried to get. Publications and research. Uh, these are all open. Um, since we're a university, we don't really do that much proprietary research. You can access us through various uh, deals and you can talk to us for various things that aren't published. But f at the final stage, the things that we publish are open. And so we've done things like looking at Japan's uh, startup ecosystem. How has it developed over the past 20 years? I'm writing a book about that too. And then uh, evaluation of economics, the third arrow, and then the second, third arrow. There's a lot going on. It, it's often too easily dismissed as irrelevant, but actually if you go look and it takes the, the patience of an academic to do this, but about uh, 200 pages worth of specific KPIs and see how they uh, have been achieved or have not been achieved, or they were set in a way that they would be achieved anyway, um, you can find a few patterns. And so are the right, what, what should be added to this? Uh, what direction should be shifted, etc. And how has Japan's political economy been changing? Those are some of the themes we're looking at. A recent paper we, I just did with, uh, Takeo Hoshi, Hoshi Sensei, who's an economist, who's the director of the Japan program here at uh, APARC, um, looks at the VC industry and sees how it has developed. Theme Silicon Valley. We also look at Silicon Valley itself because understanding the ecosystem is critical for harnessing it. And uh, we've had a, so there's a lot of scholarship on it and a lot of good academics have done very good research. And it's very good research, and it's also certain that you will never read it because it's not written in a way to be generally accessible. Yes, sometimes it's boring. Yes, the debates that academics often get very excited about are, well, that's right, but are you sure that this precondition holds? And if not, it changes your R value by just a little bit. And so the statistical significance, but that's not the debate that you're excited about. You want to know, is this believable or not? And there's a lot out there. So we synthesized it for you. And you have to understand the history of Silicon Valley in order to harness it. Another one, the basic idea of the algorithmic revolution, right? Human activities, processing power is applied to them, and it moves it towards hybridization where the productivity rises and eventually automation. This has been accelerating. So we do what you would in a business world consider thought leadership, but we also have uh, academic uh, bend to this. So we try to hit both areas. So the idea here is some of the things we do is in Japanese, we hit a business audience and a general audience with our books and publications and things. And in English, we analyze Japan. And in Japanese, we analyze and introduce things here. So we do this. I was born to do this kind of thing, so it's very fun. So uh, we also do, looking at a while ago, when we started this project four years ago, people kept asking, well, are there any Japanese startups? Are there any Japanese entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley? And the answer was, I don't know. The answer that everybody would say, I, I know a few, but we don't have a full picture. And so we decided to start uh, compiling a list four years ago of all the Japanese startups we could find. Japanese startup defined as the founder at the time of the company founding, at least one founder was a Japanese citizen at the time that it was founded. And we found a fair number. And then we've been tracing that over time because some disappear, uh, some get bigger, some move back to Japan, so, and some are uh, bought out, etc. We also went in and did some case studies. And in, and in this case, we don't need to make a business, uh, unlike business schools, we don't need to make a business out of selling cases to make a teaching point. It's just a three-page document interviewing the founder saying, well, uh, what's your story? 
uh, why are you in Silicon Valley? Uh, what are you trying to do in Silicon Valley? What are some of the challenges you face? And we just open it up, and so anybody can use it for their future research. So we started with a bunch. There are more here. And many of these were done two or three years ago. Some have withdrawn from Silicon Valley. Some have uh, done an IPO. Um, others have done an IPO and then moved to Japan. Others have been bought out. And so we're going to do a second wave of case studies. And so this is one of the things we're going to do. And as I'll say later, that was the startups. Next, we're also going to do cases for big companies. Now, one of our focuses, and it's especially relevant uh, uh, given what's happening in the United States right now, and especially today, actually, but that's a separate uh, issue. It's high context. However, uh, Silicon Valley has a big problem with uh, women not being able to uh, uh, basically found companies to be able to work, to be able to uh, exert their full potential for a variety of reasons. Uh, Japan has this problem, too. And both are quite severe. And so this is a very important uh, area to explore and support. Because of course, in its ideal form in Silicon Valley, we get the best and brightest from everywhere. And then the people who work the smartest and the hardest with the best value added venture capitalists can then create companies that scale the most and then take over the world. But if the power of women with very good brains, working very hard, good teams, this is not being harnessed, then it's not living up to its full potential. And same for Japan, but in different ways. And this is, from a policy perspective, a nice area because I was very tired. I came to the United States in the late 1990s for college, and that was a bad time for the Japanese economy. And it was a good time for the kinds of discussions saying, Americans saying, Japan needs to do this, Japan needs to do that. That's why it doesn't work. That's why it doesn't work, as though they know all the answers. This was terribly frustrating because things like, yeah, uh, your, your bubble was caused because real estate price is going up forever. That was your assumption. Oh, that's so silly. Oh, the same thing happened here in 2007-8. So there's some of that. But this is an area where it's not one side talking down to the other side. Uh, it's both have severe problems, and we need to go solve them. And so we got networks of people to talk together. So we discussed progress and challenges in women's advancement. We share practices and organizational features. We got startups from Silicon Valley and from Japan. The Tokyo governor was supporting this. Uh, we looked at what government policy is doing. It's surprising for people in Japan and outside Japan to see the kinds of things the Japanese government has been doing, uh, because it's, it's more than the US government has doing, and uh, training sessions and providing support, et cetera. And we've done this a couple different times, and we've pulled together networks that uh, are starting to become valuable. So that's one of our ongoing things. Our big key uh, marquee event, our core event that we're doing that's a big deal uh, is the Silicon Valley New Japan Summit that we do in partnership with the media company Ishing. And this vision is to have a lot of Silicon Valley startups meet with a lot of big Japanese companies and they do business development together without necessarily having venture capitalists in the middle. It's fine to have venture capitalists in the middle, but not a necessary requirement. And many of the startups that are Series B or big enough are happy to start working directly with Japanese companies. But then the Japanese companies have to be uh, very serious about working with them, not just doing a safari park of, oh, let's take a look at Silicon Valley. Oh, that's this very interesting ecosystem. Oh, look how people work. This guy's sitting on a ball, bouncy, you know, not, that, not, not safari ecotourism, but actually business matching. So the upside is that uh, this, last year we had about 65 Silicon Valley startups and then about 120 Japanese companies with about 400 to 600 people total here at Stanford doing business matching. The first part of the event was we gave uh, teaching various panels and things, learning experiences uh, in Japanese, and then we switched it to English, and then we switched it to business matching, and it was a two-day event. The problem was, in order to filter out the safari park people, we had to charge for admission for it, also because this venue is very expensive, which means that it wasn't open. Uh, and there were some articles that came out of it, but these articles were in Japanese. So one of the things I'm going to do today is introduce some of the lessons from here in English and then get it out there so that it can be part of the uh, commodity knowledge that people can build on top of to understand what's going on and what some of these companies are doing. And as far as I know, 
uh, this about 600 people, 400, 600 people getting together in Silicon Valley for Silicon Valley and Japanese company matching. That's the biggest one without venture capitalists in the middle. It's the biggest one in the history of Silicon Valley Japan relations that I've ever heard of. However, that's 600 people. Uh, China, Silicon Valley, it's 3,000 people twice a year, right? So we still have a lot of work to do. And my ultimate vision for this is that we're starting this out as a university because it's not a very good business proposition. It's still not big enough to be profitable. But if it becomes profitable, then the university doesn't have to do it. And then some company can do that and make it an annual thing and build an ecosystem. But while it's not profitable, that's why we should do it as a university. We still have a ways to go. So this kind of thing, where I also want it to be valuable. And uh, in order to get more interest in that, um, we also do this event, um, a sort of a pre-event in Tokyo, where it's easy to gather people. And there's a very interesting pattern in the audience here. And um, often, although there is some good news, often when I give talks to uh, other types of audiences for think tanks, et cetera, uh, research institutes in Japan, public forum series, few hundred people, uh, a lot of people are it's, it's very bright because um, they don't have much hair anymore, which also, which is about the, uh, it's, it's fairly senior people. So the good news here is the people that came to our event in Tokyo, they're, they're, they're middle level people. Now there's another organization in Silicon Valley that's doing wonderful work called the Silicon Valley Japan Platform. It sounds a lot like the Silicon Valley New Japan Project when you reduce it to the letters, but it's different. And what they do, and it's very valuable, is they bring the top, some top executives from Japan and try to have them meet with elite top level Silicon Valley people. And they do a retreat in, uh, <coughs> over in Half Moon Bay at the Ritz Carlton and they meet. This is very important and it's at the top level. And I think they should keep doing that the way they do it because this is more important. As a university, we can't, we can't handle a lot of top executives at a time. We can only do one or two at a time because uh, a lot of teams come and try to figure out, make sure that they're traveling in the right way, et cetera. However, what we can do as a university is to hit the middle to upper, ex upper level managers. Executives be below the CEO level and also middle managers, the bucho and hombucho division heads, et cetera, that are going to do the actual work with their teams to meet startups. That's what we're targeting. And so from that metric, I think we succeeded. So a lot of the lessons will come from here. Oh, and this year's summit, and you can look at the, uh, if you just search this, uh, it'll come up. But it's November 5th and 6th at Stanford, <clears throat> right down the road there. And we're on a course to having 100 startups from Silicon Valley this year. We're making it bigger. And the first day we'll be teaching uh, with a lot of panels and a few keynotes. And the second day will be the full day of business matching. Now, other things that we do include ideathons. And of course, I'm, I'm going through all of this because if any of your companies feel like doing any of these are some of the ways of harnessing Silicon Valley to do some of this. Uh, we get students around and try to solve some um, questions, pressing questions uh, that the millennial Stanford students might have insights on that the other companies couldn't. Um, we also do a lot of outreach. Um, we go to various events all over the place. Uh, Nikkei has a nice series, Agritech Summit, FinTech Summit, uh, and et cetera. We collaborate with several different places. Mistletoe is uh, Son Taizo's uh, uh, company and fund. Son Taizo is the younger brother of Son Masayoshi of SoftBank fame. Uh, SPICE, Stanford Program on International and Cross-Cultural Education here on campus. Berkeley, our friends up there. I did my PhD at Berkeley, so um, growing up in Japan and living in the United States was great training for going to Stanford and then Berkeley and Stanford because uh, navigating different cultures is important. OECD, uh, ETLA, this is not obvious, but it's the uh, Finnish Economy uh, Research Institute and uh, KO Media Design. School. We do various collaborations. So some of the topics that we look at include, um, and some of these have reports out. So working, earning, learning in the age of intelligent tools. We did this jointly with Berkeley, at Berkeley with the OECD, with some very hard hitting uh, frontier knowledge people and people who are uh, taking actions, former governors, former Google executives, et cetera, uh, to talk very seriously about where we are going with AI and labor. Uh, and Human Autonomy in the Age of Automation. Uh, this was an event that we orchestrated with uh, Son Taizo uh, as Mistletoe. 
And uh, this past spring, uh, we also, as part of outreach, we do uh, educational uh, collaboration with the um, Stanford Program on International and Cross-Cultural Education, which it's called Stanford eJapan, but it's a distance learning course for Japanese high schoolers where they get to learn in English and they actually get individual instructor, uh, instructor attention to focus on once a week they receive a lecture recorded by somebody here at Stanford, often Stanford professors or yours truly. But then uh, they discuss in real time using software once a week and the discussion. So things like critical thinking, uh, to be able to active participation in discussions. And also there's a research and writing requirement where they do a research paper in English and they receive feedback on it. Um, and uh, our research assistant, Elin, helped out with this in the collaboration. And so the usual question of you can provide an education here, but then how do you scale it? You can scale some of the um, uh, recorded content easily, but the hands-on part doesn't scale quite as easily. So we're still trying to figure out how to do this. That being said, I think that also fits well within our uh, mission. And we couldn't do all these things if it weren't for the uh, support given by companies. Uh, we have very different levels of engagement and different support levels. And my sincerest thanks to everybody, all the companies who have uh, supported us, because this is one of the forms of industry university collaboration. And the way it works is, of course, if the things that we start doing are of no value to any companies, then the list gets shorter and shorter, and then we can do less and less, and then eventually <laughs> go somewhere else. But uh, uh, as long as it's value added, the value is there, then we can continue. So thank you. Kozo Keikaku Engineering, Future Architect, Komatsu, Misoto, Canon, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, World Innovation Lab, JX Nippon uh, Metals and uh, Mining and Metals, ANA, Akel, uh, Kawasaki Heavy Industries, Daiking, SMBC, Panasonic, Development Bank of Japan, Tech Firm Group, Mitsubishi Corporation, uh, Canon, Musashi Sakai Driving School. This is an interesting story behind this. Uh, the New Economy and New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, Densol, and we have a few other strategic partners, including media and uh, industrial growth platform. So thank you. Now let's get into the meat of what we're talking today. Uh, setting the context first, a brief overview of Silicon Valley and Japan. So when Japan was the strongest in the 1970s and 80s, it did about three important things. First was it reshaped global technological trajectories. Right? A lot of the Japanese success then was based on technologies invented elsewhere, such as in RCA labs, uh, Bell labs, AT&T labs, but these big American companies were not successful in commercializing these uh, technologies as products. And through a very uh, series of very interesting deals, there are some studies on this that are uh, done by former journalists and whatnot that go in and look at the people who struck the deals and how they did it. It's quite amazing. The entrepreneurship, not entrepreneur, but entrepreneur, and hard work that went into Toshiba, Casio, Seiko, uh, in developing CMOS chips, quartz watches, LCD panels, etc. So they reshaped global technologies. Second, they transformed and created major global industries. There was a complete reshuffling of global players in industries such as semiconductors, automobiles, consumer electronics, etc. If you were to line up the top companies, this went from uh, good names American traditional names like RCA and Zenith, which many of you haven't heard of because they've been gone for a while, uh, they shifted to Japanese company names. They've also contributed to innovations in industrial production processes. Lean production pioneered by Toshiba, the combination of zero inventory, but also the type of information sharing where information from the shop floor could work its way up to improve quality, Kaizen, right? Until then, the Detroit model was to have a, uh, um, for automobiles and all other industrial production was the design happens and then it goes down to manufacturing, but there's no information feedback loop the other way. And the lean production system revolutionized this by having new information flows. So during this era, Japan forced everybody else to adjust. And in the United States, the companies that could adjust, they then shifted to a new model. Those that could not adjust successfully are gone. And so the failures failed. Now, this is what Japan's dominance looked like. And given my age, I vaguely remember this, but I was in elementary school. To some of you, this was, uh, you remember this clearly. To some of you, it should be news. 1989, the world's market cap. Remember, market capitalization is the number of stocks outstanding times their uh, market price. 
And so the world was dominated by Japanese companies. This was, in retrospect, looking back, we know this was the very peak of the bubble. But at the time, we didn't know that it was a bubble. Japan, many people thought, well, is it a bubble? But it's still going to go up. And people in the United States were mm, pretty scared in many ways. So this is, was the height of uh, Japan bashing, et cetera. I mean, look at this, 1 through 18. There's almost uh, complete dominance. And then uh, 19 through 40. So here we go. This is what Japan's dominance looked like. And of course, market capitalization doesn't necessarily uh, measure underlying industrial strength. But of course, it's a nice measure, and everybody pays attention to it. So, so then Japan was disrupted, uh, largely by Silicon Valley. Two different things happened, right? In 1990, the asset bubble burst. And so then large companies had to halt a lot of their investment plans just as the IT revolution hit. And Silicon Valley became the leader, partly as a, re a result of Japanese competition. Because semiconductor manufacturing that dominated Silicon Valley, well, a lot of the Silicon Valley se semiconductor companies did not survive the Japanese competition. But the ones that did survive adjusted and did things differently. They went to a higher value added uh, strategy. So among things that happened was, for example, uh, reshaping global technological trajectories, rise of the PC industry, right? The value is no longer in assembling the PC. The PC became a market of many different aspects, right? There was the operating system, the software, the uh, hard disk became a market. And so the value is no longer in the assembly. And most of the value came from the uh, Intel chips, the microprocessor standard, and then the operating system. So that's a different trajectory. And then since then, uh, the idea of co uh, competing based on flat platforms and smartphones, this all came from Silicon Valley. Transforming major global industries, Apple, Cisco, Oracle, Microsoft, later Google, Amazon. So one could ask the question in the mid-1990s, why didn't Japan produce Cisco? Why wasn't it Japan that produced Microsoft? Right? Well, it's because these companies had changed the rules of the game enough that they undermined the uh, core competition, the core competitiveness of the Japanese uh, successful companies through the 1980s. So the global top market, uh, top companies shifted. And then new production systems, right? Designed in California, manufactured in China. That was partly a reaction to Japanese manufacturing quality. You just go higher end here, design it here, then cultivate the know-how to be able to manufacture in China. Uh, and that's a new way of making things. Uh, and open innovation. So, and also Japan also suffered what I call, this is a separate stream of research that I do, uh, the Galapagos phenomenon, as it's referred to in Japan, Galapagos. I call this leading without followers, because things like um, feature phones, as they're known, cell phones that connect to the internet. When I came here in the late 1990s, Japanese cell phones were tiny. They started to connect to the internet with IMO, that you could do email. And I came here, and the cell phone was the size of a shoe, right? People say, I got a cell phone, man, and it's, it's huge. And I thought, OK, Japan is clearly ahead. When is the world going to catch up? Or when is Japan going to dominate this area as well? I was waiting and waiting. And before it dominated the world, it got disrupted by smartphones and the Galapagos got. And so there's a pattern. And I'm writing a different book about this. I've written some papers about it on why this kept happening in IT. Japan was a leader, but without followers. So Japan had its own problem. So it was disrupted by Silicon Valley. And even, um, I do the joke. Uh, in longer presentations, right? It even looked like Galapagos, this one twists, and it's a very interesting ecosystem. This one smells good, and you can have different scents. And so it's, it's very different from what eventually unfolded, clearly leading, but no followers. And then it got disrupted. They don't make these anymore. So organizationally, what happened? One of the things was that the large US company model until the 1980s was actually a lot like the Japanese model, right? Long-term employment, seniority wages, in-house R&D, and relatively stable set, stable set of suppliers. There were phrases such as, once an IBM man, always an IBM man, right? Um, well, not just where are the women, but also it means sen uh, seniority system, lifetime employment. The HP way was also famous. We take care of our employees, and they work their whole careers at HP. Uh, GM was this way, too. Until fairly recently, the uh, presidents of GM were all from inside the company. So 
it wasn't the case of the United States was very different and doing open innovation from a long time ago, and Japanese firms are very different because they have these unique features. Well, actually, if you go back to 1950s, 60s, and 70s, big US firms, until the ones that were disrupted were di disappeared, were often resembling in a fair amount uh, Japanese companies. But then the ones that adjusted in the US survived. And so those that did not adjust were disrupted. So open innovation in the United States, where we see the model of taking M&A as a way to do R&D, getting people from outside, and also cutting a lot of people. IBM almost went bankrupt, so they cut 40% of their workforce, shifted towards services. What happened to that 40%? Well, they had to go do other things. So if you have a lot of good people who are cut, then there's a labor pool there. So they have to do entrepreneurship. They have to join other companies. And so this was sort of um, ignited by that. So it was a transformation. Started in a similar place, Japan was strong, then the US adjusted, now it's Japan's turn to adjust. That's the macro story we're talking about here. And so the production paradigm revolution that did occur here was shifting how value was created. That's the PC story, right? Or Cisco had 96% of the market share worldwide of uh, internet routers. Uh, whereas Japanese companies were very strong in traditional communications equipment. Why was Cisco so strong? The quality of their product wasn't very high. The quality of Japanese uh, communication uh, switchers was very high, very low failure rates. But that wasn't where the value was anymore, right? The value shifted. So uh, another one was a shift from electromechanical to software, right? The Sony Walkman was a, a wonderful engineered product taking something big like a tape recorder and making it that small, energy efficient, uh, durable. This is electromagnetic. But then the uh, value shifted to software, which is a disadvantage to long-term employment, skills that are on the job training. All of a sudden, many of the advantages of Japanese companies became disadvantages. And modular design products, of course, when things become modular, you can substitute pieces of it. And what Japanese companies are generally good at is putting together pieces that are not easily put together, assembled, like cars, for example. So, so that's what happened. And the rise of Silicon Valley is what drove a lot of this. It wasn't an even, oh, here's the US model that shifted all over. It was driven largely by Silicon Valley. And the semiconductor industry was historically here, but in Silicon Valley, the co-evolution with the PC industry, software later, the internet and subsequent waves of cloud, uh, et cetera, were from here. And the interesting thing about Silicon Valley is, of course, it's not a set of firms. I can name some superstar companies that are now nowhere to be found. It's the whole ecosystem. Right? Yahoo is a great company as of 15 years ago, but it's gone. Uh, um, 3Com is great at networks, except no one uses it anymore, and it's not, it, does it still exist? Sun Microsystems is the pinnacle of, oh, it's Facebook bought their uh, uh, office now. So this sign is, if you go to the back, it says Sun Microsystems, right? So it's not companies. It's the ecosystem that produces waves and waves of companies. How do you deal with somebody that's not a corporate long-term partner when the companies keep changing? Again, this is not a strength of the Japanese. Uh, corporate uh, systems. So the attention to Silicon Valley is because many parts of the ecosystem are complementary. They work together to fit together and they en enhance each other. Venture capital does not work as well as it does if there isn't labor fluidity because they can, uh, along with capital, ascend in people as well, which doesn't work as well if you don't have universities like here pumping out people with high levels of expertise, which also doesn't work if you don't have a supportive ecosystem of um, law firms and accounting firms that are very good at handling startup ecosystem and doing deals and figuring out how good stock option um, uh, different types of uh, stock options are for employees or for M&A, et cetera. The whole ecosystem works together as a system. So we'll talk about the Silicon Valley system next, but here's what the result is within the United States, right? IT-related market cap, 1980, there's IBM, 2000, some Silicon Valley companies, along with Microsoft, IBM, that have significant uh, operations here. And then 2016, you can see the rise of Silicon Valley companies. Um, cash reserves. Right? Unless we have hyperinflation, uh, cash will still be a pretty good uh, pile um, unless oil shock type things happen again. And the top 20 cash reserves, well, a lot of these are in Silicon Valley. That's why your rent is so expensive. There's so much cash sitting here. 
Now, uh, the dramatic shift in leadership looks like this. 1989, world market cap dominated by Japan. 2018, dominated by Silicon Valley plus um, Microsoft and Amazon. So let's learn more about the Silicon Valley ecosystem. Here's where you can go learn about it. One of the things we did in our project was we put together a Silicon Valley ecosystem essential reading list and you can find it in our resources. Once in a while we do uh, study groups and every few years, I mean everybody who was in Silicon Valley moves on, um, the, the peop the, most of the Japanese employees here and, we, and the students, uh, and so we redo it every few years. But here's a list of the absolute essential readings that you should do if you're going to do your own study group or Benkyokai, and you can just look here. We've, we've filtered out the not very good ones for you, so these are the good ones. And of course, Silicon Valley, we're here. The traditional uh, historical Silicon Valley is here. Uh, if you think of Silicon Valley as a venture capital uh, fueled high growth startup ecosystem, then of course it includes Sa San Francisco as well. And of course, since not many people can live here or here anymore very easily, then of course it includes the East Bay. And so I would call this the broader Silicon Valley ecosystem encompasses this whole area. Um, and of course, you can do fun things that are proxies for various things. How do you measure what you're going to measure? You can measure income levels by looking at where Whole Foods are and then compare it to where the Walmarts are located. Right? Um, so it's interesting that Amazon decided to buy Whole Foods, other than the fact that they can't buy Walmart. But if you think about Walmart trying to access various customers, how are they going to access the people who are in the Whole Foods area? You could do the same thing with Tesla dealerships. Uh, or something like, and Google and Amazon won't tell you how many Google Voice or Alexa uh, devices they sell, but I'm pretty sure that the distribution looks a little bit like this too. So uh, this means many different things, but this is the sort of Bay Area. And the main characteristics of the Silicon Valley ecosystem, uh, finance and government startups, so venture capital, finance is venture capital, human capital, uh, high level and diverse human resources for all stage of startups, high labor mobility. Uh, if you're trying to harness the ecosystem, how do you get the best and brightest to work for you? Uh, let's say you're a Japanese company. It's not easy. Just paying high wages doesn't mean that the good people will come uh, because you can be a not good worker and still demand a high wage. So how do you figure this out, um, et cetera? Industry, university, government interactions. There are some top class universities. The uh, ties are multifaceted. Right, the uh, previous uh, president of Stanford, John Hennessy, is now the chairman of Google. Uh, this is not an honorary position. He's started two different companies while he was a computer science professor. He's been on the board of Cisco and Google and some other companies for quite some time. So it's really multifaceted. And the supportive role of government in setting basic research trajectories is quite important. Originally, Silicon Valley was uh, funded a lot by uh, the Department of Defense because you need semiconductors to calculate the ballistics of uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles or the mission to the moon, et cetera. These days, the NIH, National Institute of Health, uh, some big research projects and research directions that they would like to do that trickles down into places like Stanford Research, which then goes out into spin-outs. So one of the reasons that automated driving is such a hot uh, area right now is the Department of Defense did run some contests to uh, try to get automated driving accelerated from some years ago. And this, the uh, Stanford uh, automated driving project led to some industry collaborations, et cetera. Industrial organization, the coexistence of large firms and small fast growth firms, highly competitive industries, and again, and then culture acceptance of failures, but it's evaluation and monitoring. If you fail in a good way, there's another, you can, you can uh, reboot, but if you fail in a bad way, you're probably done. So it's not just accepting a failure. I, uh, for example, Theranos. Right? Elizabeth Holmes is probably not going to be successful in starting another one. That's a bad failure because it was fraud. Uh, but some good failures, such as some other companies, say, I really wanted to do this. I started it. It was working. We were growing. And then Google decided to do it. They ate us. Sorry. That might be seen as you gained good experience. Here, have another try. So uh, the point there is to say that the ecosystem is quite different from Japan. So how do you harness something like this? 
uh, the history very briefly. I mean, Japanese large companies have been here for a long time. Virtually all the big companies were here. Uh, a lot of them were trade and supplier relationships, and they were company to company, not harnessing the ecosystem from the inside. Because most Japanese who are here, the people uh, that were from Japan, not Japanese Americans, Japanese people from Japan were uh, from the companies. They were not individuals. And of course, this place is very good at accelerating and magnifying the abilities of individuals who then make companies. But if you're already from a company, it's hard to get in and make use of a lot of the uh, accelerating factors. But by the way, here's a fun anecdote that, uh, about the Japan Silicon Valley history. Uh, the book by uh, Isaacson um, Innovators that looked at Silicon Valley had this wonderful example that's quite critical and also uh, instructive. Intel's invention of the microprocessor was a watershed moment in the history of humanity and in Silicon Valley. It's 1970. It was a single chip capable of multiple functions enabled by software. Until then, it was just about integrated chips that were special function. And so there was a Japanese company called Bizicom, uh, Bizicom, uh, that was uh, originally, uh, the name was Jap Japan Electric Calculator. So uh, they, there were lots of these. There were, uh, calculators were a hot market, a very hot frontier market. And they ordered lots of IC chips. Lots of Japanese companies did that. This company ordered from Intel. Intel said, OK, sure, we'll make, I forget the exact number, I think 23 uh, different ICs for Busycon. But then they realized we can't do all of this at the price point that we agreed to. But under development was already uh, the blueprints of a microprocessor, which was a single chip that could do multiple different things using uh, software. And so they, they talked and co-developed, ended up helping uh, to develop and succeeded the pr uh, creation of essentially the microprocessor. And the interesting business deal here that was critical was that the contract stipulated that Intel would not sell the semiconductor, the microprocessor, to the 4004 to any other calculator maker. So Bizicon thought, okay, that's great. They're not going to sell it. We have an exclusive. But it turned out that that wasn't the market that mattered. It gave birth to the microprocessor ma market and to PCs, well, before that, workstations, et cetera. And the calculator market collapsed. And so it turned out that the calculator market was then disrupted by microprocessors. Digicom went bankrupt a few years later. So in this sense, this was a good deal. But in the macro sense, it ended up creating a game changer. And it wasn't just the technology, it was also this business deal, where if a similar company to Intel had had a different deal, then it might not have been able to become such a platform player. So anyway, there's an interesting uh, tidbit of history there. So uh, harnessing Silicon Valley is not easy for anyone, not just Japanese firms. For example, Nokia, that at one point just completely dominated cell phone markets. Right down the street, there was a Nokia Innovation Center. And they were doing open innovation. They were talking to startups. They were working closely with various entrepreneurs. They had lots of very interesting ideas. But uh, the Nokia corporate culture, and there's a book on this, looking at the rise and fall of Nokia. Uh, as you recall, Nokia then got disrupted by smartphones, and then they got bought out by Microsoft. So Nokia's market share went from world dominance to zero in just a few years. They had an open innovation place. It was great. But the uh, headquarters just didn't do anything that came out of here with that. Their strategy was, as smartphones started, they say, OK, we're going to make our own smartphone, plat smartphone platform. And it rolled out two years later than the others. The game was already done. And they also tried a variety of things. But just having a presence here wasn't good enough to save them. But they were right there, and they put a fair amount of re uh, resources into it. SAP is a big exception because their core revenue was coming from their uh, uh, core industrial software. But then they made a big, big center here. They co-developed design thinking with uh, Stanford and ended up creating funding the D school here as a methodology, which has wild success globally. But at the same time, SAP hired several thousand people. And their core revenue, as, as they'll tell you, uh, went from their traditional business to this new set of businesses. And now the new set of businesses is greater than what they traditionally had. So that's a, a success case. There are very few that worked out like SAP. And of course, uh, the history of corporate venture capital, which is where the investors are primarily a company, 
uh, that are then has been operation that's doing VC investing. Uh, there's the, the history of corporate venture capital is strewn with corpses, dead bodies of corporate venture capitals that did not work out. At every downturn, usually what happens is there's a wave of, and this is not just Japan, this is from all over the world. Corporate venture capital comes in at the very end of a bubble cycle, and then everything crashes, and they're the first ones out. And then after a while, it comes up again. And so it's even to the point that some people say, when you see a boom of CVC, that's when uh, you know that we're near at the top of a bubble and it's going to burst soon. The problem with this is that a lot of big companies, when they see it go down, they immediately pull back. So they end up buying high and selling low many times. It's not a very good business practice. Right now, we have a, a very big growth of corporate venture capital. This makes some people very nervous. Uh, then the question is, is this time different from the last time? In a different talk, I think there are some differences. But uh, the point is, one attempt to harness Silicon Valley is to do corporate venture capital. And most of them haven't worked very well. But there are a few cases that have worked very nicely. Japanese firms have particularly severe challenges because the default moves of what they do tend to be the actions that work the least to harness the uh, ecosystem here. There are a couple of Japanese articles that uh, Ishin uh, interviewed me for and went out. And it turns out that I, um, I was hoping to become famous as a scholar, but I became famous for peddling worst practices. Uh, successful consultants will sell you best practices. Uh, as an academic, I'm very skeptical that best practices exist, because if it's best, then everybody will do it, so it's a commodity. And the ones that are basically using your own company's uh, 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 strengths and uh, particular markets, th th those aren't really best. It's best for you. But what we can say is that there are a set of practices that are the worst ones, that are almost guaranteed to not work. So I made a list of them, and this got circulated quite a bit. We don't have to pick up all of these in English because it's not uh, that value added, but just a few include vague missions such as information gathering or find strategic partners without resources or without a real good uh, mission. Uh, lack of awareness or need to, uh, for the need to appeal to local actors. We are so-and-so a company. And in Japan, all, if you ask for a meeting, everybody will come up to you and say, yes. And here uh, you say, I'm such and such a company. And they say, sorry, we're busy. Uh, or they don't understand. And there's a severe misunderstanding of what you're, oh, yeah, you're that company. No, that's not who we are at all, actually. But um, OK. And so, uh, and, and so a startup will say, oh, oh we're busy. And then, but if you treat them as a regular small medium company as you would in a Japanese uh, cultural context, of course they'll, uh, you, they'll meet this person and that person in your company and they'll do this and that. But here the startups stop meeting you. Or somewhere like Google would uh, <coughs> be expected to have a meeting and the, the big Japanese company person expects that their counterpart is somebody fairly high up in Google. And so they say tell to their employee, oh, go get a, uh, 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 meeting with maybe the CTO of Google. And so then when they can't get the meeting, it's the employee's fault. And the poor employee says, well, but, but they won't just, they just don't meet us. They don't really care. But what do you mean you don't care? So there's this kind of thing. And this happens to other com countries too. Um, but it's fairly severe. And can't act long term, right? Japanese companies are famous for being much more long term than big companies here. Because the counterparty risk here is you're working on this very interesting set of things, and then all of a sudden your emails don't come back. The whole division has been shut down. Everybody's been fired, and there's no one else to take the place. That's what happens here in Japanese companies. Even if the people move, uh, somebody always takes their place, long-term commitment, et cetera. However, for people here on the ground, since maximum is usually about three years, they, the first year, it's very different here. So it takes a while to get established. The second year can do a lot of good deals and business. Third year, your time horizon shrinks and shrinks. And so by the end, you can't actually do anything that's going to take longer than the rest of your time here, because the next person who's coming is not known to you. And it's not assigned yet. The person is not assigned yet. So you can't actually have a longer term relationship. And that's been a problem historically. And then uh, the first 10 was so popular that I wrote another 10. Um, and there's a couple more there. But again, it gets depressing. And that's not what we're, well, that's not the uh, purpose of this. Um, but some include not being able to mentally differentiate between small, medium enterprise and startup. What's the difference between an SME and a startup? One of the differences is that the purpose of a small, medium enterprise is to not go bankrupt. So a uh, very slow growth is fine. Uh, stable growth is fine. But for a startup, if it's received venture capital investment, massive scaling, 
fast growth is a necessity or else it'll get shut down. The venture capitalists will say, in our portfolio, there are a lot of fast growth companies that I'm going to put my bets on. You're doing okay, but not so great. All right, bye. And so if that's the counterpart, then you can't uh, deal with startups by saying, okay, uh, for this issue, uh, we will go study the issue, or we agree to do this now, but I need approval. Uh, the meeting for approval happens in three months. We'll get back to you. But the startup needs it in two weeks. So there's this mismatch. And also the issue of startup being, oh, we've established and we've moved pretty quickly and we think we're going to do this, but the startup turns around and moves somewhere else. That's not loyalty. That's not polite. That's very mean. But maybe they're so, so focused on needing to grow that they can't afford to be that stable and slow. And so it's a different logic. Again, again, another uh, common thing that I often hear with the large stream of people that come through saying, oh, we have cash, we can buy a company. We'd also like to come to Silicon Valley with the idea that we could maybe in the future think of post M of m and as well. Well, what are you going to do once you buy it? Um, if it's, say, an insurance company that's already in the U.S. that's established, you buy the insurance company and you can improve it, but you let it do basically what it's doing. But if you're a startup and you put them inside your company, then it's just a small division without resources. Are you going to give it more resources? Or is somebody going to step in and say, well, that's a small division with very small resources, very small profit. Oh, not even profit. Why are we going to give attention and resources to that? And then the team says, that's not fun. That's not why we were bought. And then they start leaving. And then it's really populated by people who are, well, who should we put this person? We don't know where to put them. Oh, let's give them to there. So very bad things happen. And then they say, OK, you bought it because you thought it was going to grow, but you didn't give it the resources to grow. And it didn't grow. And so you shut it down. And then the people higher up say, well, that's why M&A doesn't work. And then a different executive comes in and says, oh, well, I think we can also do m and because we have cash. And this keeps uh, going round and round. Um, also, the we can make this too syndrome. A uh, startup will bring something, and it's a prototype that's it's not that great yet, but the idea is good. And then the business division will say, well, I can make something like that too. And what could be the case is, yes, you could in three years. They're almost ready to go, and they're just looking for a partner to be able to scale. Whereas if you start from scratch, it's not. And it's a play on words. It's a uchidemo dekimasu yo shoukogun, which sounds a little funnier in Japanese. So the we can make it to syndrome. These are some of the worst practices. So there are, there's no single best practice set, but there are many lessons we can learn from some of the innovative companies that are doing new things. Uh, and these are coming from the summit. Uh, part of the thing that we did at the summit was we got some people who have actually been uh, in the Silicon Valley ecosystem for a long time to give a keynote. And last year, it was uh, Mr. Sachio Senmoto, who co-founded DDI, which was the first, he's the initial, the, the Japan's first IT entrepreneur because NTT was a monopoly, a telephone monopoly, communications monopoly. And when regulation shifted and allowed competition, DDI was the first private company that he started with the founder of uh, Kyosera, Mr. Inamori. They made a company together, and he and three other people were in a small room. He grew it and then bought KDDI and got bigger and bigger. He grew it to a uh, revenue of 40 billion in 2015, and the market cap was 65 billion when I just checked. So he's actually one of a uh, very successful entrepreneur. And one of the things that he actually did early in the 80s was the initial uh, rules for competition in Japan in the telephones were interesting. One of the cash cows, the most profitable areas of long distance telephones. And in order, they said, OK, you can use not NTT for your uh, long distance, but you have to type 0077. Some of you remember this. So if you're going to make a long distance and you're not going to use NTT, you have to push extra buttons. Well, that's a very difficult competitive situation. But Senmoto-san thought, hey, I think we could automate this by making it in a box so that you plug in the box and it'll dial it for you. He went to some of the big communications firms like N NEC and others to make a chip like this, but they couldn't do it. So he came here to Silicon Valley, and he found a company called PCSI, which was uh, founded by one of the people who was in the early Qualcomm team. Uh, and he developed this chip called Alpha LCR. Maybe you remember it on the phones when you were younger. Uh, it said Alpha LCR, but that's what it was. And um, they put it in a box that NEC and all the uh, other uh, 
uh, communications equipment firms did, but it would basically look for the cheapest rate and then use non-NTT lines automatically when it was cheaper. And this was an early case of actually going to harness Silicon Valley, because he did that. And right after that, his stock price grew 100 times, 200 times, and he listed DDI within five years. The average time for listing for companies in Japan then was about 29 years. And so this was before the small market cap mothers or Heracles Japan or these others were founded. So this was a very big deal. Interestingly, he was at the front seat of some of the Silicon Valley uh, uh, dealings that he shared with us. He was invited to the board of directors of Network Appliance, which is currently called NetApp. It was a fast growth company that did servers. And now with cloud computing, they're starting to get disrupted. But uh, before that, basically servers were a very, very robust growth business. And uh, Sequoia Capital, Don Valentin, Senmoto-san knew him. And he invited him to the board of this. And Senmoto-san was the only non-American, only non-European on the board. So uh, what he saw was quite shocking to him and quite shocking to the audience when he told us. The company was growing like this. And then one day Don Valentine uh, came in and he had talked to the other board members. He didn't bother to talk to Senmoto-san because he wasn't quite inside inside. But he was on the board. And then all of a sudden, the uh, they called up the CEO of the company and said, OK, you have two choices. Uh, we will have a fight now, and you will leave because you're going to leave the company, or you will agree to leave the company right now and never come back. Those are your choices. What do you want? And this was completely shocking because it wasn't that the company was doing badly. It was growing very, very fast, but not fast enough for Don Valentine. Did it scale enough? Not quite. So he brought in a whole new management team. And sure enough, interestingly, the company grew much, much, much faster than it had been. It went much faster. And after this, Sam bragged about um, how the stock price went up and he got very rich off of that. But that's OK. Um, so the point here is, and then he went on in Japan to start two more companies. Uh, E-Access, which was an early one, uh, a Japanese startup using DSL. Uh, and then E-Mobile, which was a competitor in the mobile. And then his most recent one was a clean power uh, company. But this was Japan's early serial entrepreneur. Um, and Komatsu, OK, this is, we're getting into the companies now. Uh, IT Frontier in Massive Equipment Deployment. We had a nice uh, panel here. And those of you who hear me talk a lot know that I absolutely love Komatsu. It's not just that the little boy in me likes these big trucks. Uh, it's how they do this. So the holy grail of Silicon Valley is autonomous driving. They've been doing this since 2008. Of course, there are no pedestrians here. but uh, So it's a closed environment. It's much easier. But the reason they were doing this, and I'm telling you the non-Silicon Valley parts first to get into how Komatsu thinks about this. Why do they do automated driving? Well, yes, it's true that the driver is, it's terrible conditions doing all this all day. It's 50 degrees Celsius in the Australian or Chilean mines, and it's a terrible job. And they have to go all night, too. And if you make a mistake, the uh, stakes are very high because uh, big costs if you make a mistake. But what they did was, it's for the tires. They automated the driving because they found that if they had automated dump truck driving, the tires would last 16 months instead of 12 months. Each of these tires costs about uh, $200,000. So not having to replace the tires helps the operators. And so it's not about how much equipment they sell. It's about saving costs for the operators. Since the operators save costs if it's automated driving, that's why they do operated, uh, automated driving. That's where their value is. So, uh, and they also, uh, well, yeah, that's OK. <clears throat> and what they've been doing since 2001 is standard equipment. And this is well known in Japan, too. But from here, since they don't advertise this, this is shocking to many uh, people in Silicon Valley, is they've had uh, IT systems connected to all of their heavy equipment all over the world since 2001 standard equipment. So they can check <coughs> through sensors the wear and tear on parts that require maintenance or replacement, usage data for demand forecasting. Um, if you look at the world map, it's interesting because you'll see all the Komatsu things all over, although China is a black box. You're not allowed to bring the data outside of China. And then if you go in, into a different room, different protocol, then you can see China once you're in China. And they were saying, OK, are we going to make a lot of inventory because China is growing? Well, all the numbers coming out of China in, well, as of a few years ago, um, 
they were growing and everybody was reporting it's going to be great, but they noticed that their machines were not being used very much. So they said, ah, the numbers are not so good. So uh, they're being inflated. So let's not build up such a big inventory. So there was a moment where Caterpillar, their competitor that's a little bigger than them, made big inventory for the booming China market and they cut down their inventory. And then it turned out that uh, it, the robust growth stopped abruptly and they were in a better position for this. Or sometimes examples uh, of people who you'll hear in Silicon Valley saying, yeah, in the future, you can have cars. And if your lease is not going to, if you haven't paid your lease, the car company can stop your car. They can make it non-operational. And people go, oh, well, Kumas has been doing that for a day, more, quite a long time. Uh, and they've been able to do that. So the future is there. It just depends on where you look at it. Uh, but it's not really the future. It's happening now. So, uh, and. Another interesting thing was they could say, oh, by the way, sir, uh, your um, operation, the fuel level seems to be decreasing, but your machine is not being used. I think somebody's stealing your gasoline, which is a big deal depending on what part of the world you're in. They were also uh, able to say, oh, your machine is not moving, but the engine is on, and I think it's during lunchtime, which means I think that what people are doing is leaving the engine on and staying in the cabin and taking a nap or eating their lunch because it's so hot. So you will save costs if you make a small temporary room that's air conditioned that everybody can go to during lunchtime because the fuel efficiency is terrible for these things if you're just going to use it as an air conditioned room. So th then providing value to the customers by saying you can reduce your costs by doing this. It's that mentality. So. One of the th another thing that they did that is interesting, and this debate is every time I talk about this in Silicon Valley or to frontier people working on the future of automation and how human activity is, uh, they are all wow, uh, very, very impressed by this. Is <clears throat> they, they have uh, equipment that allows low experienced people to do very high skill jobs. So this kind of motion of digging a slope using one of these pieces of equipment takes about 10 years of experience because you're looking at it this way. It's an awkward motion. And if you make a mistake and dig too far, you can't just use like Play-Doh and say, oh, we put that back there and then make a big building. Uh, you can't do that. You have to recalculate and recut it. But with this automated uh, shovel, you can actually, once you get it to the place that you want, it can do the cut. And so it can be your first day having a licensed operator of this. So you've just removed, made an uh, inexperienced person a skilled worker. And as a paradigm, this is the kind of paradigm that we're going to see in all sorts of equipment. Uh, and this just can't happen fast enough if we look out there. So because there aren't enough people. And that's, that, that's often the case. So this is what Komatsu has been doing. And so what, how, did they use, um, how did they use Silicon Valley? Well, one of the things they did uh, that's critical, a paradigm shifter, was they met a drone company called Skycatch. They met them in November of 2014, signed a contract with them in December of that year, announced it to the press in January, and did a test showing to their top executives, and then they deployed it in seven months. What did they do? So Skycatch is a San Francisco-based drone platform uh, that's a data analytics. And what they wanted was surveying. So if you're on a construction site, like here or like right there, it was interesting watching this as I um, almost went crazy because there used to be a parking lot there. Um, uh, so to survey it, well, how much dirt do you have to move? What are the measurements of where you're going to carve, et cetera? And they, they have the posts and something like how Justin has back there and then do this, you know, the surveying. But if you just send a drone up, you get a 3D map of it, and then you can calculate very quickly how much dirt needs to be moved. So if you're in a hurry, you can use a large number of equipment in a short amount of time. Or if you're not in a hurry, you can use a smaller number of equipment and use uh, more time at a lower price. So what's the volume of dirt being moved? And one of the main problems is, let's say the trucks bring three tons of dirt, except it's only actually 2.5 tons of dirt. You can't measure it very well. But then when you're about to make something, there's not enough dirt. So you have to go order another uh, uh, transportation, et cetera. So this was a big pain point they had. How do you get good 3D mapping data? And it was something they didn't have internally. They did not have a drone division internally. They had people working on surveying systems. But they saw this company and thought, ah, this is going to solve our problem. Let's move fast, because this looks great. So. 
uh, here's how they, they, they did this. And it's a big success. So they're, they're doing this um, uh, all over in Japan now. It's called Smart Construction. And it turns out that the Ministry of Construction even um, adopted standards very similar to Smart Construction to be able to provide uh, data for con government bids, too, because they wanted to accelerate in the whole industry. So this is a big success. So how, how did they move to avoid a lot of the worst practices in Silicon Valley? Um, so the first was, uh, one of the worst practices is the local operations here don't have enough resources. But what Komatsu did, they had a CTO office, but they renewed it as a very aggressive investment uh, CTO office. Uh, CTO offices until then were largely, and it's still the case in many large Japanese companies, it's a cost control center. Right? You have an IT system inside the company and you have to manage it. It's a cost. But this was, even when the company's overall budget decreased a little bit, the CTO office budget increased. They went to go do aggressive investments. So there, was resor there were resources. And there was a, uh, so how to, how to handle the lack of interpersonal networks in Silicon Valley if you're a Japanese company? Well, they decided to invest in two different uh, venture capital uh, companies, one Draper Nexus, large one part of Draper Network, and a smaller boutique one, Core Ventures. And they also became a member for quite some, from a while ago, in several Stanford research groups. The uh, CARS, which is the uh, Center for Autonomous Research, uh, Center for uh, Automated Research, and, uh, anyway, the uh, Automated Driving Research Group that's over there, uh, that uses machine learning and et cetera. They were a member of CARS for some time. Uh, and also in UC Berkeley, there was a uh, there's a group called Citrus there, Center for Information Technology and in the Interest of Society. That's like an umbrella, and they said we want to send one of our engineers to this machine learning uh, lab, and they just did that. And they're going to do some other joint projects. So they they use networks through here, and they met Skycatch through uh, introduction from uh, Draper Nexus actually. Slow decision making is another problem. Well, the CTO office that was renewed. Uh, is known for fast decisions because they not only have resources, but there's a very strong top leadership support. Uh, the chairman and the president and the CTO have a very strong and very short uh, pipe between them and a very thick pipe to be able to talk frequently. And there's quite a bit of trust established. So when the CTO office person says, this is good, and they talk to the CTO, and the CTO says, this is great, and they immediately move it up to the president and chairman. And so it's quite fast. And in fact, what they told Skycatch, and at our summit, the uh, founder of Skycatch was also there. And it was very, uh, uh, they had fun talking to each other too, because the Skycatch guy said, it was fun because we thought we were fast. And when we met Komatsu and they said, we're going to partner with you, Komatsu said, once we start running, we will be faster than you. So are you ready? And he said, yes, they were actually very fast because they were going global much faster than we thought. So, uh, so they're fast. Another big problem for Japanese companies here is that the Silicon Valley office tends to be isolated. Um, I, I run an emotional support group for, for poor, uh, this is a joke, but emotional support group for isolated Silicon Valley office Japanese employees who have lots of trouble because uh, it's not clear what their function is. They try to, uh, they become, end up becoming a, uh, a travel agency for executives to visit, et cetera. So, so that, it's a real problem. But what Komatsu did, actually they didn't make an office here. Uh, they have an extremely energetic CTO office innovation manager where I think they, he, he has one of the records for how much he flies per year on ANA a because uh, he's, he's, I've never met anybody who travels more than him and I've met a lot of people who travel too much. But he's always very friendly and very um, engaged and uh, rumors are maybe he's a robot. But he actually goes all over the world travels a lot, gets information from interesting places like um, Israel, and they do ideathons and hackathons in Israel, and then tell us here what they're doing, and then go to Sweden, and then talk about how all the newest machines there for cutting trees, right? You cut down the tree, and our machine just measures the length, the, 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 the girth of the uh, tree, and then communicates to the market to figure out what length it should be cut at for the optimal market price. It does that while it cuts it, measures it, and then cut, 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 and then loads it. That's interesting. People here say, wow, I didn't know about that. That's very interesting. So what can we tell? Let, let me tell you about something interesting. 
by telling them people here something interesting that they've never heard about, he can talk to people here who have very interesting things to say, as opposed to, can I come, uh, can I come meet you to learn about this or that? And then he think, well, that's fine, it's good for you, but what are you gonna do for me? I'm very, very busy, right? So he's able to go past that kind of thing. Uh, though, and then of course the challenge is, um, hmm, that's a great strategy, but does it scale, right? I mean, he's, he's come with uh, several employees of his in his team. They, they all look really tired, and it's always a different person. So uh, does it scale? But there are people like this in every company, and so that's how they've done this. And of course, often Japanese firms don't understand. They have to sort of, uh, they're the ones trying to sell to startups. I know you have problems. We can solve your problems as opposed to what can you do for me because we have the resources, et cetera. Well, depending on how you look at it, right? Often they don't have as much resources as say the VCs can mobilize. So what is it really that you're giving? Oh, we can have global presence. If you put us on your, if, if, if we put you on our global retail network or global customer network, this will scale you in a way that you can't. That's a good way to do it. And so this was the gathers and brings information from all over the world, and that's what they do. But, but basically, how do you appeal to it? And the leadership doesn't understand Silicon Valley or technology. This is a common problem. Uh, and interestingly, Komatsu, every year, they have a, what they call the technology advisory board meetings, but they get interesting people. Uh, and every couple of years, they come to Silicon Valley. The president, the chairman, the CTO, the top leaders, and then we help mobilize people for them that are very frontier people in Silicon Valley, and they talk to them, and they show this is our future vision. What do you think? And oftentimes the reaction from large companies, not only Japanese companies, we can't share our future vision with you because it's proprietary. Well, if it's such a proprietary vision, then are, are you sure? Um, are you sure it's 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 that valuable? Because if you're going to do something that's such a big surprise, maybe. But most corporate visions turn out to be it's not actually a secret. It's just you can not. Are you the ones that can achieve this first? Are you the ones that are so different from it? Often not the case. There's a tendency to hide things even if they're not so critical to, um, to, to actually hide. So they come and they open that to a group of people. And they don't have them sign NDAs because that's another famous uh, worst practice of large companies anywhere. Oh, to show you anything, we need to have you sign these NDAs. And then people here say, look, I'm busy. I have better things to do. Sign an NDA, oh, forget it. So. Uh, they don't do that kind of thing. And then after you sign the NDA, what you learn is just not very important. It's just they're being very cautious. Uh, so then, so that was Komatsu. And um, yeah, Komatsu also does some very interesting things. But uh, next, Yamaha Motor Ventures and Laboratory, Silicon Valley. Uh, in 2015, they established this. Uh, after they sent one guy, Mr. Saijo, here to try to figure out what the strategy is, he was surprised he couldn't get appointments. He had a desk in plug and play. Uh, but then when he decided to come here, he was able to uh, convince his bosses and the company president that he would be able to develop and pursue business opportunities even if they were going to disrupt the current businesses. He said, I won't do this unless you say it's OK. Because otherwise, what could happen is to say, well, I don't want to disrupt anything that uh, we're doing. In, or you start to do things that are very interesting, and headquarters says, actually, one of our business groups says that what you're doing could disrupt us, so we'd like you to stop. And then they ended up getting disrupted anyway. So he got this agreement ahead of time, and this is fairly unusual. He also didn't just want to do a corporate venture capital. He wanted to make a development lab. And the first thing that he wanted to do was say, okay, I want to do something that nobody's ever done in the world before. Nobody's seen anything like this. And so what he decided to do was to create a humanoid motorcycle riding robot. Uh, this is a regular motorcycle. It's not a special motorcycle. And this ro motobot, uh, you pick him up and then put him on a motorcycle and then run it and then the, it'll ride itself. Why would you do this for a motorcycle? Uh, because, you, I mean, what? what why have an autopilot robot on a motorcycle, which is a one person um, usually thing? That's the wrong question. The, uh, the question was, uh, what they found was that SRI, uh, which used to be Stanford Research Institute that spun out in the 1970s, it's a research center right uh, nearby, they had a lot of people that were interested in doing automated driving, and they could do the algorithms. 
but no American company and no other company was going to actually make something like this. And so when Yamaha came and said, we'd like to make a humanoid robot that can drive itself, they thought, this is great. So Yamaha expected to pay quite a bit to do this. But actually, SRI was so happy to do it that they only requested a much lower amount than uh, Yamaha expected, Mr. Saijo expected to uh, pay. And they developed it within 10 months. And this was very interesting in the effect that saijo san said it had on his engineers in the home office too because sort of like formula one right i mean does the formula one technology really go into the regular uh, um, cars well some but often not really it's also for motivation but the engineers basically got very excited about this and one of the things they said was oh here's a prototype that's fascinating you know i bet we could make it lighter so they were able to make it quite a bit lighter and sleeker etc by the way um, all of these things that I'm saying are coming from articles. It's not proprietary, and if I misinterpret it, it's my fault. It's not the fault of the people giving this to me. So, and of course, they're giving me good stories, too. There's a lot of pain behind all of these. But still, uh, so to build something, and they had this race against the, one of the fastest motorcycle racers in the world. <laughs> Luckily, the person won, so they still have work to do on this. But this kind of thing where it's more like a demonstration project, because they're not going to start selling this immediately, effect was interesting. And they could do that only because it's a lab, not just a CVC. And so more Japanese companies have plenty of resources to do things that are creative and new, that get people excited here. I've not met a single person in Silicon Valley who, when I show them a picture of this, didn't say, oh, that's so interesting. And then the second thing is, oh, I didn't know about that, right? Well, that's part of what we're here for, to uh, get word out more. So uh, Honda Open Innovation in Silicon Valley. This was another very interesting talk we had. Um, Honda's been in Silicon Valley as a car seller forever. But um, in 2000, they opened a basic computer science research office here. But then the dot bomb crashed. Uh, and then in 2005, they decided to make a CVC. Uh, but then they realized that actually as a car company, they're really not interested in the financial returns. In fact, making financial returns off of a non-automobile investment is something they really don't want. So they pulled back their CVC and then said, let's regroup. And they decided to make it a, a lab instead. And they built two different things, the Honda Developer Studio and the Honda Accelerator. And the Honda Accelerator is very interesting because it takes an approach to open innovation that until this I had never seen by a Japanese company. Uh, in this panel that we did in the uh, uh, summit, it was a, a talk along with a company called Drive Mode, which is one of the uh, startups, Japanese founder, uh, but HBS person, Harvard Business School graduate, and another Japanese person who had been here for a while and worked at Tesla for a bit. And Drive Mode is basically an app to optimize your smartphone for driving because there's many things that are very dangerous to do on a legally and as a person or smartphone. But the way that Honda collaborated with them was to make spearhead a series of standard making, standard setting, so that you could control the built-in uh, <clears throat> entertainment system using your smartphone, which was kind of a big deal because if you think about it, inside the car company, there's a whole division that does this kind of thing. And you're just saying, okay, you guys, we've just replaced you with the smartphone. A fair amount of internal uh, opposition for it. They went a step further and said, look, for a lot of developing countries like Southeast Asia, in Southeast Asia, people do not even buy these things as an option. They buy one that doesn't have them. So what if we just provide a space and a connector so people can connect their own smartphones into this? And of course, this disrupts the small but real business of Southeast Asia, in that case, of people that do buy this. Because who's going to buy something that has your infotainment system built in when you could buy one that could be your phone instead? They've just killed their own higher paying market, right? And when was the last time that you used your own you know, infotainment system and thought, oh, this is great. I love the interface. It's so useful. I can use it for everything. Never, right? And it goes obsolete very fast. So the idea there was that the clock cycle for updating these is much faster than the clock cycle for updating your car. So you'll be happier with your car if you can use this. L big internal battle to actually get drive mode 
implemented, but they won the battle. So partnering with the Silicon Valley firm that was initially only, um, only about five guys, and they were guys, five guys in a garage, they were really in a garage, uh, had a lot of hurdles that they went by, not just the business deals that they were going to disrupt, but also operationally. And this is a pain point for all big companies. Because when they said, we're going to partner with the software firm with five guys in a garage in, uh, at the, at, uh, it was, I think it was in Mountain View, uh, Sunnyvale. I was in Sunnyvale then, they've moved since. Uh, the, of course, the uh, legal team said, okay, here's our contract, boom. Here's our NDA, boom. And then we also, for all our suppliers, require $5 million equivalent of insurance. Because if you're an auto parts supplier and you're making things and somebody's arm, you know, or if it explodes, or something, they need a lot of insurance. Clearly, this was inappropriate because the most dangerous thing that was going to happen to these guys in a garage was carpal tunnel syndrome, right? Because they're coding all the time. So, they, the what what Mr. Sugimoto did was using his own budget. He brought the H headquarters legal team over here and had them come and look at it. Because of course, often when you're in the Silicon Valley office and you're trying to do something and headquarters doesn't uh, does frustrates you, it's not that they're being mean. They're just doing their job. They just don't know the logic of here. So he said, I'm going to use my budget to bring them over and then give them the logic. And of course, the headquarter team, once they saw the five guys in the garage, oh, you're right. This big NDA doesn't really make sense. All we need is just a one pager because they're not going to steal our industrial secrets of how we manufacture things. They, they're not coming to our, they're doing something different. And the supplier insurance requirement is very different. So uh, they were able to waive that. So they have a different process now for dealing with startups. And the biggest surprise for me with the Honda Accelerator is basically it's an accelerator. All big companies want to do accelerators. But uh, what they don't have is this. So to startups, Honda contributes the resources that is exactly what the startups don't have, which is automotive engineers and prototype test vehicles along with the space, not just the space, because the space is the cheapest thing for the uh, <coughs> uh, big company to uh, give. And so, and money is the second cheapest thing, but what's less cheap is actual engineers who you might need in your home op office operations. So they gave some of that. And this is the, this is the key point. Uh, the startups that come to the accelerator can actually decide to offer their services or products first to somebody that's not Honda. And the reason is, and it's not exclusive. I'd never heard of that before, because usually the thinking of big companies is, oh, they're going to come to our accelerator, which means we're exclusive, so we're going to be able to take their things. But by doing that, of course, GM is much, much bigger than Honda for in terms of the uh, installed base. So their thinking was this. If Honda decides to implement what they work on along with startups, they could do it within a year because they've actually sort of co-developed it. So they can introduce it fast. But if you start from scratch, so if the startup went to GM and said, OK, let's do this, for it to be redesigned, just the life cycle of a design of a car, it'll take three years. And for any IT product, two to three years is a big time. So that's what they're looking at. And how on earth Sugimoto-san was able to convince the executives to do this non-exclusive is uh, quite something. I, I know a lot of executives, I haven't met his bosses that have uh, done the deal from their side. I want to sometime, but uh, fascinating. But this is a great way to engage the startup community by making it not exclusive. Because for the biggest reason, the biggest reason for startups to not go into an accelerator of a big company is the fear of having it being exclusive. And then you have adverse selection, which is that the startups that go to a big company accelerator, if it's not good for the startup necessarily because they have to, they're locked in, the only startups that are going to go there are the ones that don't have any other options. But the startups that you want are the ones that have lots of options and they choose you, right? So there, this goes around that. It was brilliant. The next collaboration was Panasonic and Citrine, which was Quite interesting because, uh, so first of all, Panasonic has had a CVC for quite some time. They pulled back for a while and then they came out again as a new uh, entity. They made a new one uh, in 2017 and orchestrated it differently. It was a hundred million fund to invest in startups basically here, but the investment decisions were made locally. So instead of having it be a business unit or a division, they became 
uh, <coughs> general partners to uh, <coughs> a, start, <coughs> a venture capital startup <coughs> sorry, started by two people who were insiders in Silicon Valley <coughs> to begin with, uh, Kerry and Paul. And they come from Intel Capital, and the other was in Sequoia. And interestingly, I find they're both Asian Americans. And so it's different from the uh, mainstream uh, uh, venture capital, which is dominated by large uh, Caucasian men, basically. Uh, so it's a different angle already. And there, there's some soft things here, too, because uh, it could be that they're more they're a little easier to present to headquarters. Uh, maybe they can talk in a slightly different way. Maybe they feel that uh, it's less being talked down to. They can have an equal footing. A very interesting choice. But they basically said, here's the funding. We're not going to demand strategic returns. Go get your financial returns the way you want. And the carry, which is that if they do well, these two individuals will do quite well for themselves if their investments turn out. But that's fine for Panasonic. And Panasonic also has a couple people in the VC that don't make the decisions for investing, but they're always looking to see where is the strategic uh, return that they can get from it. Where's the who can they connect to within the company? Citrine is a uh, material informatics uh, platform company. They gave a talk here. It's interesting. They use big data to uh, analysis and machine learning. They basically go into companies and pull out all the data for experiments to make metal alloys. Uh, and metal alloys, if you're looking for a certain characteristic, then you make a hypothesis and based on your prior experience, and let's say you want something with a certain property, and it's x percent a certain kind of carbon, and x percent a, a little bit of zinc, et cetera. And then you experiment. And the typical company experiments, a big company experiments maybe 9,000 or 10,000 times before they find something with the exact properties they want. Uh, and there's a lot of data on there, but it's not being used very well in most places anywhere. This company goes in, takes up the data, says, OK, from your past data, we know that these parameters we know. These parameters we don't know, but we're going to make a guess based on our machine learning algorithms. So here's your hypothesis. How about you try this? Then the company can say, OK, we tried this. Then whatever guesses there are, they have the true values for it. And the machine learning algorithm improves. And so eventually, with some of their um, Citrine's uh, 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 own experiments, they were able to reduce the number of times that, uh, that experiments had to be done by maybe 70 75%, which is great. Because the initial hypothesis comes from amorphous sort of prior experience. Good engineers have a better intuition than others. But this is data. But of course, Citrine doesn't get data but itself. It needs data from places like uh, university, open data, and other places, and companies. So they decided to work with Panasonic. Now, Panasonic, many of the business divisions weren't that interested in working with Citrine. And the process for saying co-development meant it would be a big deal, lots of approval needed. So, but it wasn't so expensive. So what Panasonic did was they said, the local office person said, this is a purchase order. We're just going to call it a software purchase order, even though what we're actually doing is bringing in the software as a platform and co-developing it. Because internal company politics, purchase order, yeah, sure, we can buy uh, some of Google's tools, we can do this, uh, no problem. But are you going to co-develop something? Oh, R&D gets involved, et cetera. So they actually used this technique, and uh, uh, it, it worked quite well to get the proof of concept through. Very quickly, SoftBank and Eris. SoftBank, not the uh, vision fund from Son Masayoshi, the uh, very big fund, but this is the SoftBank telecom side. Eris is a startup that provides IoT solutions. Um, uh, and what they were able to do was the pain point for Eris was that they needed uh, companies that are operating all over the world and doing some things that they could scale into. Uh, whose IoT solutions are you going to put in? Uh, and SoftBank Telecom had operations all over, and they made a joint venture, Eris Japan, uh, a couple of years ago, in order to hit Asian markets. And one of the things that they were able to do was SoftBank Telecom was responsible for a lot of the operations of Grab. In uh, I think the in this case the market was in Malaysia where they rented the cars to the drivers. 
if you're going to have the car and rent it to the driver, you can put in an IoT solution fairly easily and take a whole bunch of data. And so for Eris, this was great because they had no direct access to uh, Malaysia market or to be able to get all this data. But by partnering with SoftBank, they were able to all of a sudden scale very quickly. And they had some internal processes to make, be able to work that pretty easily. So one of the things that Japanese companies can offer is, OK, here's our market in Southeast Asia that we do, or somewhere else, and you can test it out there. We all know the Japan market is often very difficult to test things for, move slowly, existing big players. But a lot of Japanese companies have robust businesses all over the world. So using other company uh, operating areas, and this is great for startups who want to scale. And finally, um, we, we do have a lot of people from Mitsubishi Corporation, so I would get uh, in trouble if I don't put this. But um, not just because that, but because the attempts are very interesting. Um, this is uh, uh, Haruko, who gave a talk in, uh, in our Tokyo summit uh, a couple months ago this past summer. So uh, Mitsubishi Corporation, which is a trading company, has an a organization called MLab. Uh, they've had a long pre the company's had a long presence in Silicon Valley with an office and a corporate venture capital. And after a few years, after one pullback after the dot com crash, there's a new push. And it solves, it's attempted to solve many of the problems that hit um, uh, Japanese companies. And I, I never get nervous in my presentations except where the unexpected presence of the guy who made uh, MLab, Mr. Yanagihara, is here. So everything that I say that's incorrect is uh, my own fault. Everything that sounds like good things is because he's been very convincing to me. And feel free to be skeptical. But I believe it's true. So uh, the idea here is, well, first of all, a uh, person of uh, Mr. Yanagihara's uh, executive level is rarely posted here in Silicon Valley as a Silicon Valley office. I'm sorry, can you tell me your actual English title? It's a executive vice president. Executive vice president, yeah. So especially in a, a traditionally uh, organized company like Mitsubishi Corporation, an executive vice president level person being posted in the Silicon Valley office is very unusual. And what this means is that, um, <laughs> this is hard, sorry. <laughs> but, but, uh, it's hard for me too. <laughs> <laughs> what I think this means, or the intent, is that then if you're going to make decision making, rather than having to work with the headquarters, a piece of the headquarters is here. So you're able to see things on the ground and get a better sense of what's going, rather than having trips coming here all the time, uh, it's trips going back to headquarters to, adjust, uh, to uh, report on what's going on, which is different, usually, than lower level employees reporting. So, uh, and each business group has a presence here in MLab. So often the problem is there are multiple business groups and then one person is sent here. But the person, if they have a deal that's, not from, that's for a group that's not their own business group, how are they going to establish trust and make sure that a person can, from the Silicon Valley, try to convince the business group they're not from that this is something that the business group should do? It's often not very convincing. And then if you have multiple projects that you have to follow, if you're one or two people here and you have eight projects in different business groups, that means a lot of traveling back and forth and going drinking with the business groups and saying, well, how's it going, et cetera, and it doesn't scale very well. So the idea of MLab is they have one person from, or they have people from each business group who are here, so the pipe to each business group is much more structural. And, uh, and MLab has not just Mitsubishi Corporation itself, but other Mitsubishi com group companies and some other companies that aren't strictly the Mitsubishi group per se, but they're friends of Mitsubishi there. So it's not just a single company, but multiple fairly friendly companies or group companies there. And this hasn't been done in Silicon Valley in a, in a scale that MLab is now that I've seen before or uh, heard about or read about. So this is new. And they also participate in uh, Mitsubishi Corporation is one of a uh, major investor in uh, venture capital, which is Geodesic, which is co-founded by the former uh, CEO of Wilson Sonsini and the former ambassador to Japan, uh, John Roos. And so there, th this, who knows to what degree this is a diplomacy play, but at the same time, uh, John Roos, if you say his name in Japan, they say, oh yeah, that was the ambassador. You say his name here, it's more about, he was the CEO of Wilson Sonsini, which is one of the major law firms here. So his role there is uh, 
what makes him famous over here. So his new venture capital has networks that are accessible. And of course, they've posted a couple people in there, and they can figure out how that kind of thing is being done, and there are networks. And there's also a training program, a push to create new innovators, and about 20 people here are from that training program. And this kind of scale, with 20 people or so coming fairly young, two or three years, or nine or 10 years, or the maximum of 15 years or so, uh, this also is very atypical. Um, a different company has brought uh, and there are many ways to do this. There's no right way yet. But this is a fairly young cohort and a fairly large uh, commitment. Uh, they've been getting um, a course from the design, the design thinking from the D school and several other places in Silicon Valley. And the idea is not a one-shot thing, but a multiple iteration. So this is a new uh, attempt too. And so. What we're saying here, and this is what we're going to end on as a discussion to be continued next time, because as, it's, as I've already shown, it's, there's a lot to go, and there's no real right answer. Right? Each of the strategies has advantages and disadvantages of sending people to Silicon Valley. Well, what are you sending them for? In what form? Frequent trips? Uh, embedding in a university, like right here? Uh, accelerator? Co-working space? Uh, plug and play likes to sell uh, space? Uh, and Sometimes people come and say, well, here's the steps. First, you go to an accelerator. Then you make an office. Then you do a, a limited partner investment into a venture capital. Then you make a CVC. Well, it's not necessarily that that order is appropriate or that it's going to be more likely to succeed. Each of these has um, advantages and disadvantages. Your own company, Silicon Valley office, the consortium office. How long are people posted? Uh, very short is definitely bad. Uh, I keep meeting people from different companies who say, I'm here for this month only. Uh, nice to meet you. I have a few things. Okay, bye. Next person. Oh, I'm in Silicon Valley. And I can only do this only so many times and I can't handle it anymore. Other people say, I'm here for three months. Other people say, I'm here for six months. But they're here and then they're gone. And so uh, is that okay? Well, the upside is that a lot of people do sort of get a sense of what it's like here. So when they go back home, it's not like, oh, Silicon Valley, it's what I read. I hear Elon Musk was smoking a joint on an interview, but I don't know what that really means. Uh, we don't know. So, so there are downsides to it, which is that they don't build any networks here. It's hard to figure out what they actually want. But the upside is that having a little bit of people who understand the logic is very different is better than not. If, if there are pitchers over here, then you need lots of catchers over there. So what's the right balance? Not obvious. How many people? Most places have too few people. Uh, I've never met a place that has too many people. But given how many resources and how many people Japanese companies have at their disposal, I think it's uh, pretty safe to say more people. But then the question is, are you getting the right people? Right? Uh, this doesn't happen these days anymore as much because it's expensive here. But sometimes you'd meet people from big Japanese companies in Silicon Valley who are, uh, uh, you think, oh, did they, did they do something that didn't work out so well? So instead of the promotion track, they're on a different track and they were sent, we're not sure what to do with it. Well, let's just send them to San Jose office. This used to happen. But how can you possibly do deals with startups from people best and brightest coming from all over the world if you're somebody who is sort of sidelined, right? There was a mismatch there. So what kinds of people? Ideally, you probably have people who your company would really like them to be in headquarters. They don't want you to not be in headquarters, but sorry, we're sending you here and because you need to be here. So resources, personnel, structure, what's the goal? These are things to think about. And of course, investing in a VC fund as a limited partner. Yeah, you can get a lot of information. You can get connections to startup. You can get some experience. Uh, and of course, the usual question is, are you going for financial returns or strategic benefit? If it's strategic benefit, how do you measure strategic benefit? It's very difficult to measure it. So if you could do financial returns. But then if you think about it, most VCs, the financial returns, unless you're in the core top VCs, the amount of financial return you can get isn't that great compared to the revenue of a big company. So the financial returns don't matter that much. So what are you doing it for? Uh, so you need to think about that very carefully. And what's the team that you're going to work with a VC fund? Do you just give the money and let them run? Uh, do you send people in? But the people that you send in have never evaluated startups before. Are you sure you're helping or are you just a burden? How does that work? What do you do with the people who are in there next? 
corporate venture capital, to set up your own corporate venture capital. There are lots of ways to do this badly. And I have another, another article away that's going to make me infamous with the uh, venture capital community, but maybe in a good way helpful to the big Japanese corporate. Uh, there are many ways to do this very badly. So personnel, what are the personnel? What's the strategy? Again, is it a pipeline for M&A? Somewhere like IBM, their strategy was uh, another event that we did here a few years ago uh, that we worked with Will, World Innovation Lab with. It was called Moment. But a person from IBM CVC was saying, look, we're IBM, we're huge. No matter how much the startup is going to make money for us, it, it's not, this fund is going to make money for us. It's not going to move our revenue stream. What we need is to buy a company, pull it inside, and it becomes our core offering. Then it can shift the needle on the actual revenue. That's what it is. And it's okay if the CVC loses money. That was what IBM said at the time. But other places think very differently. So what, what is your strategy there? And how do you create a pipeline to your business groups? Great, I'm glad you invested in an interesting startup. How is that startup going to work with the business group who don't, might not want to work with it? Or what if you've invested in one company and the business group wants to work with a direct competitor? And what if the direct competitor looks like it's going to win, but the CVC was not able to invest in that one, they had to invest in this one? Do you work with the company that your CVC has invested in, but what even if it looks like it's going to be a loser? How do you set that up? Right? Many things to think about. And I'm hoping we can have an ongoing discussion and research for this kind of thing. And if we had more time, we'd start a discussion. And in a few months when I do another one of these, we can have it a discussion based and we'll sell it as that. So this is going to be to be continued. Um, thank you for today. We're going to continue to gather, ca gather cases and search for insights. Coming soon are the cases of these companies that I just introduced and some others on our website. Just a few pages that you can use to refer to and to send to your bosses to say, look what they're doing. If they can do it, shouldn't we be able to? And so please stay in touch. Uh, we have a website. Please join our mailing list from there. Uh, we have Twitter. Uh, our Facebook page too. There are many ways to keep in touch. So thank you for today and we'll see you soon.